often is, is trying to describe human experience, trying to, as W. H. Auden put it, keep reality on the agenda. And I think it's 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 that act of trying to describe experience to articulate this this thing we all take for granted, you know, this here now, subjective experience, they can actually learn really important, tangible truths about how the mind works. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there are any questions from the audience now or or if I should uh and there are microphones on either side, and if you'd like to ask a question, actually just on this side, if you'd like to ask a question, I'd like to ask you to go up to the microphone and line up at the microphone in order to ask your question. So if you'd like to do that, go ahead. Hi. Um, I was wondering if through conscious effort, through rational thought, we could change the response patterns of the insula or the nucleus accumbens, uh, or maybe change their relative threshold levels? Sure. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, I think uh, there's some preliminary evidence that I think to the surprise of many, you actually can. And this is another study done with Buddhist monks. Um, and what you find is that for a long time, people had thought that the amygdala was one of these primal brain structures we just simply couldn't control. It was too primal, too reptilian, too deep in the limbic system that all the training in the world couldn't alter its activity. But you actually find with Buddhist monks that when you play them a startle response, so something like a backfiring car, that, that you actually see a reduced amygdala response, that, that they have this kind of baseline level of calm that is very tough to penetrate. So, so that's some suggestive evidence that really rigorous, strict training can actually change how the amygdala responds to scary stimuli. Um, I think in general, though, most of us obviously aren't trained expert Buddhist monks, what you see is that the amygdala is pretty much a reflex, that it generates a response that's pretty much out of conscious control. The crucial variable, though, and, and the crucial variable that predicts people's behavior in, for example, fMRI experiments, is how, is how active their prefrontal cortex is, how much it turns on to compensate for this amygdala activity, for the activity of these emotional brain areas. And, and so, for example, in the case of Captain Sullenberger, you know, I think it's a fair assumption, and as he's freely admitted, he was very scared in that cockpit. You know, he was terrified. Everyone was scared. Imagine how scary that is to lose total engine power over the densest city in America. And yet, what he, and yet what he was able to do, and the thing pilots practice for in flight simulators, is turning on the prefrontal cortex to kind of compensate. This is called deliberate calm because it takes deliberate effort to stay calm under such harrowing circumstances. So I think, you know, there's some evidence on the one hand that if you really try, you can change your amygdala. You can kind of begin to modulate its response, its response to anxiety. But I think the more important variable, the variable that's more relevant for the rest of us, is, is learning how to activate your prefrontal cortex. And, and the important thing to know about the prefrontal the important thing to know about the prefrontal cortex is that it's a brain area we can all easily control. It's the brain area we can most easily control. It's, it's kind of the warehouse of conscious thoughts. So, so trying to direct your attention, trying to control what you're thinking about, the contents of working memory can have a big payoff. I just wanted to remind our audience that this is the Commonwealth Club's in-forum program, and tonight we're here with Jonah Lehrer, who is the author of Proust was a Neuroscientist, and most recently, how we decide. Let's take another question. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you can expand on uh, the question of uh, how do you decide which way to go in your decision making, whether it's intuitive or basically computational. I have a second question, but we're just going to let you have one. You're just going to let me have one. Uh. Sure. Um, you know, I think I think probably the easiest way to the easiest way many scientists would 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 kind of give us advice on how to structure our decision making in everyday life is, and this is very counterintuitive as I said before, but it's, it's the very complex decisions, it's the, one that, it's the ones that involve lots of information, lots of variables, so if there are lots of jams on display, lots of serials on display, if you're trying to choose between a car, for example, cars have lots and lots of variables, then, then those are decisions that seem to benefit most from an emotional thought process. It's relatively simple decisions or novel decisions. So decisions in which we ha have no experience or decisions that don't involve lots of information that seem to most benefit from a more rational, deliberative thought process. And that's because the emotional brain can be very, very wise, but it's also subject to a long list of hardwired flaws. So what Things you're saying, can I just interrupt? I know in your book you said that the average person spends 35 hours deciding what car to buy. And so what you're saying they've is... They've got it backwards. 
They really, should spend 35 seconds. You should sit. I'm so happy because that's what I did. I was like, I'm going to buy that car, and I did it. It took me five minutes. Maybe not 35 seconds. Five minutes might be the right amount of time. There's actually an experiment that speaks directly to car buying. And this was, this was done by, again, this research at the University of the Netherlands. And they had two groups. One group they gave an easy car buying decision to. So they gave them four cars. Each of these cars was rated in four different categories. So horsepower, fuel economy, trunk space, leg room, stuff like that. So 16 total pieces of information. What you find when you give people these easy car buying scenarios is that they make the best car decision. They find the optimal car. One of these four cars is rationally the best car. It's got the most horsepower, the most trunk space, best fuel economy, etc. That they, that they find the best car when they think it through. When they take a few minutes to consider their options and try to rationally locate the best option, the best car alternative. However, in the hard car buying scenario, and it's worth pointing out that the hard car buying scenario is much more realistic, this was a scenario in which they had the same four cars, but now each car was rated in 12 different categories. So for a total of 48 pieces of information, far more information than simply you know, the original scenario. Now what you find is that the people who are forced to rationally think it through, who, who try to contemplate consciously all their car options, now they perform worse in random chance. They select the best car less 25% of the time. The best way to find the best car in the hard scenario is to, and this is kind of surprising, to let people assimilate the information, kind of stare at the facts, stare at all these different cars and all their different categories, and give them a word puzzle to distract them for five minutes. And then while they're solving this word puzzle, interrupt them very quickly and say, quick, pick the best car. And now what you find is that they find the best car more than half the time. That, that, that because they're forced to rely on this more emotional thought process, that they're able to really, I think, assess their complex options and kind of sift through all this information and find the best alternative. That's great. I'd like to get some other people an opportunity to <clears throat> ask a question. Go ahead. Hi. I work with um, professional soccer teams worldwide, and I notice you know, a big difference between, um, for example, the emotional state of a head coach from Scandinavia compared to a head coach from South America um, versus another uh, head coach or a player from Asia. The question that I have is, is there any research um, that potentially um, is trying to determine specific ne neurophysiological identities based on race? For example, does a guy that comes from Latin America, does he have a more active amygdala compared yeah. to a prefrontal cortex or vice versa, or a German, you know, activates that part of the brain less, you know, so... It's, a great, it's a great question. I wish I had a good answer for you. There, there really is very little evidence in terms of the neurophysiology at the moment to speak of. My, my one caution, I think we can all kind of relate to the generalization, you know, I just know from listening to the announcers you know, announce soccer matches, that we listen to the announcers in Spanish, it's much more emotive. They're much more into the match. I think the crucial distinction here, though, and this is why you may not see the same, and this is why you may not see the same dramatic difference at the level of the brain, is that there's a crucial distinction between the expression of emotions, how, you know, you know, how much we express our feelings, and what's actually happening on your inside. So in the case of Captain Sullenberger, again, he described, you know, turmoil on the inside, calm on the outside. Even though his amygdala was active, he appeared calm. So, so I think, you know, I wish I had a good answer for you. It's a great, great question. Um, it, but, you know, the research hasn't been done. And I'm not sure, even if the research was done, you might not see the same dramatic difference that, that, that seems very apparent to you as a, you know, well-experienced observer of these differences. That, 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 there tends to be a distinction between what we see on people's faces and in their emotive bodily expressions and what's actually happening at the level of distinct brain structures. So the guy could be very scared, but he just doesn't show to be... Yeah, you could be very scared yeah. or very happy, but, but, but because of these cultural differences, you may not show it in the same way. So, so often the expression of emotions is very culturally conditioned, um, especially in terms of how flamboyant those expressions are. And that often doesn't necessarily correlate with what's actually happening inside your brain. Fascinating. Never thought about that. Thank you very much. Next question. You actually had a lot of sports talk in your book, <laughs> which I didn't ask you about, but there's a lot of sports examples in here. Hi. We know that people with severe 
seizures, epilepsy, or grand mal, when they have their corpus callosum severed, they can't take decisions with which shirt to take. It takes them at least 35 minutes to pick up the shirt they want to put up that day. How did they decide? Well, but that, 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 and it's another great question. Um, a lot of this work is done by Michael Gazaniga, and they've, they've shown, for example, that when you split people's hemispheres in two, when you sever the corpus callosum, the thick nerve that connects your two hemispheres, people can often act in very funny ways. And, and this is simply because your hemispheres often have two very different preferences. So there are funny examples, funny poignant examples of, for example, people will read a book with their left hand and the right hand's trying to close it or vice versa, because only one of your hemispheres is proficient at reading. So it doesn't understand why you want to look at these funny symbols on a page. And so it's trying to close your hand. They're, you know, they're probably I think the most poignant example is the case of a married couple. The husband had his corpus callosum cut, and one half of his body was, very, was much nicer to his wife than the other half of his body. <laughs> so you often see this incredible contradiction in your hemispheres, and that's simply because it gets back to the larger, I think, the fact that your brain isn't this neat, coherent blob, but actually is this distinct network of different brain areas often which have different desires, which want different things, which look at the world through different prisms and filters. And so when you subdivide the brain and you prevent this crosstalk from happening, I think you can easily expose these inherent contradictions. And, and, and you know, as absurd as those examples seem, we talked about with you know, everyday shopping decisions. You can see a similar contradiction inside the brain. One brain area wants you to buy the iPod. The other brain area says, don't spend money. So, so there's often this, you know, this similar argument taking place, and when you sever a brain area, when you sever this crosstalk, you simply make the argument transparent. So, so it's, it's the same phenomenon is happening in all our brains all the time. We just simply aren't aware of it. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Um, when you were talking about the, uh, the golf players and the opera singers, you seem to be making a a distinction between a kind of a, a fluid, unconscious automaticity um, versus a conscious control and awareness. And I was wondering, um, like a conversational speech seems to me in many ways to be um, very fluid in a very similar way. If I talk and if I'm in a very quick, flowing, fluid conversation, I'm not necessarily thinking beforehand about what I'm going to say. Yet, I, in many ways, we would want to think about that as being uh, kind of the epitome or the archetypical conscious control uh, example. So how does that um, complicate that distinction? And what do you think that that, that, that means in terms of the, the neurobiology? Uh, it's a, another great question. I think uh, that, that really elegantly captures, I think, the fluid interface between conscious deliberative processes and unconscious processes we take for granted. And I think driving is a similar way. And since that you know where you're driving and yet you can space out for minutes at a time, daydream about something else, your foot will still step on the brake and shift gears and do all the rest. And I think sentence construction is a similar thing in that there's lots of evidence from Noam Chomsky onwards that the act of constructing a sentence, putting your verb here, your noun here, slotting in you know, adjectives where necessary, that all takes place out of sight, out of awareness. It's very unconscious, and thank goodness, otherwise we'd, you know, we, we can never say anything because we'd be so worried about actually properly constructing sentences, diagramming sentences in our head. So, so that process is largely automatic, it's reflexive, and yet at the same time, it, it's got a very fluid interaction with what we actually want to say, with these conscious thoughts, with the ideas that are neatly and automatically slotted into these very well-diagrammed sentences that just flow out of our mouth. So, so I mean, I would use speech as a perfect example of what the human brain does so magnificently that we take it for granted, which is there's this, this seamless interaction between reflexes, automatic reactions, stuff that takes place in very primitive brain areas, from the brain stem to the emotional brain and upwards. And at the same time, these, these, these robotic reflexes are, are based on in, in this constant dialogue with very deliberative conscious thoughts. Next question. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, so my question is related to where you started with the choice of the Cheerios. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm the kind of person where when faced with that kind of choice, I run away and don't ever pick a box of cereal. Um, so I'm wondering about indecision. And in a lot of these studies, it seems as if, not that they're forced to, cho to choose 